What's going on? I'm about to eat. has really taken on quite a momentum over the years, it's like the fourth, and uh, we've got some, also some very important people from around the state coming who are supporting STEM education, philanthropically and so on, so it's going to be a very exciting day. Mostly I'm excited about hearing students and their thoughts and their research and their work in the STEM area. So it's almost what time? Showtime? Almost showtime. Alright, here we go. Okay, thank you. Is that the Eagles? Stephen, nice to meet you. How you doing? All right, all
It ain't an event without hood. Here we go. They ain't ready until y'all came, right? Now we ready. There we go. Good job. <laughs> there he is. How are you, sir? The honor of life. Lieutenant Governor? And what, what can you say about Howard Community College for putting this together and Dr. Khan? Well, I really appreciate what Howard Community College uh, has done. They've been at the forefront for a long time with regard to just education. I've seen this college grow. Um, for some may not know, I, I taught here for a period of time and my son went here. So I'm very uh, supportive of the college. I had an opportunity a couple of months ago to visit Baltimore Community College and their robotics program is an envy of the state and it's growing and taking off and we're very pleased to see that happen there in particular at Baltimore City State. Observing our nearest, brightest star. 
from our fifth floor observatory, so we hope you will join us for that. We have two keynote speakers in just a few minutes, Dr. Padmanabhan Sacher from George Mason University will be joining us, and later this afternoon, Dr. Freeman Rabowski from UMBC will be joining us. I am pleased to introduce our distinguished guest this morning, who has at one time taught here at HCC, and we're very proud of that. So opening our conference this morning is the Lieutenant Governor of Maryland, the Honorable Boyd Rutherford. of doctoral scientists and engineers in the nation, the second highest concentration of information technology prof professionals in the country, excuse me. We're the second, we're second in terms of STEM employment in the country, and we are the cyber capital of the country. We are home to more than 70 federal laboratories, 12,000 information technology companies, and 1,200 private sector cybersecurity companies as well. Over the past three plus years, we've seen an economic resurgence in our state. We had the best year in, in over a decade for business growth as well as job growth. We went from losing 100,000 jobs to gaining over 100,000 jobs. And now, as we like to say, Maryland is truly open for business as we continue to fuel our state's innovative economy, we want to make sure that Marylanders have the tools and the skills to compete for the jobs of today and all throughout the 21st century. We are making sure that we have a strong STEM education, and that's where conferences like this come in. STEM jobs are driving Maryland's economic resurgence, and the demand is robust for a STEM workforce not just here in Maryland, but throughout the country. This all means that now more than ever, we need more college graduates with strong STEM backgrounds. For example, if you take a look at the booming information technology field and, and computer science in general, companies in our state have often expressed concern about finding workers they need to fill those necessary jobs. The demand for high-paying information technology-related jobs in Maryland is more, more than four times the national average. Over the next decade, IT-related jobs in Maryland are projected to grow another 12%. The U.S. Department of Labor projects that by 2020, there will be 1.4 million computer science job openings in the United States. But our universities, unfortunately, are only projected to produce about 29% of those jobs. Unfortunately, we are seeing a shocking lack of gender diversity in this growing sector. In 2015, only 20% of the computer science graduates in Maryland were female. The growing computer skills shortage across the country threatens to cause higher wage costs project delays, and more time and money spent to search for and train qualified employees. In Maryland, this could impact our ability for our businesses to innovate and bring new products and services to the marketplace. It could also jeopardize our competitiveness in national and global markets. Companies routinely cite access to skilled talent as a key reason for choosing where to locate. In this rapidly evolving job landscape, 
States that have access to a trained workforce will have a major advantage. That's why our administration has been aggressive and proactive in taking action in this area. Last year, I was proud to be named the honorary chair of the Maryland chapter of the Million Women's Mentor Program, which is dedicated to increasing the percentage of young women pursuing STEM degrees and careers. In November, Governor Hogan signed an executive order directing the Task Force on Cybersecurity and Information Technology to study opportunities to grow the sector in Maryland's economy associated with computer science and information technology. This task force is focusing on developing pathways to meet identified workforce needs in the computing fields. They will address the skills needs and the challenges facing Maryland, Maryland companies in the talent pool and encourage employers to partner and invest in Maryland's IT workforce. In addition, the task force has been asked to create innovative and sustainable ways to promote gender and minority equity in STEM and IT fields. Their findings will culminate in a report to the governor that is due in June. When it comes to STEM employment, Maryland simply <coughs> must continue to lead the way by closing the skills gap and to begin focusing earlier in our educational process. I'm also pleased to report that during this past year's legislative session, we successfully pushed our administration's access initiative. And this legislation requires that by 21 or 2021, 2022 school year, each county board must require every single public school in their county to offer at least one computer science course. You would think that was already being done. We must do all we can to spark an interest for students in pursuing STEM-related careers. Because as you're aware, and as you'll hear more today, not only does STEM provide a path to a vibrant, well-rounded well education that prepares students for a lifetime of curiosity and innovation, it is also an invaluable part of making sure that Maryland College graduates have great job opportunities and a passion for the careers that they pursue. That's exactly why events like today are so important. <coughs> you are helping to get the word out about the importance of STEM. The students and participants here today, many of whom are from our many excellent Maryland community colleges, are ahead of the curve. You are ensuring that Maryland's STEM economy will continue to lead the way. And I hope all of you will enjoy today's conference and take advantage of the countless resources made available to you through this event. Thank you again for this opportunity to speak to you this morning. And good luck and enjoy. about another round of applause for our <laughs> And at this time, we're going to move on to our first keynote speaker. Dr. Panmanaban Sacher um, is a colleague of mine, actually, who teaches at George Mason University now. I actually get the, the real special honor of also calling him my friend. Um, I met Padu many years ago. Um, when he was a speaker at the college where I used to work. For a certain reason, because a certain topic brings us together. So it's usually educators, students, and, uh, you know, academic academicians and all that. But when I actually see uh, distinguished members from the governor's office come, that actually shows how much importance, uh, you know, you give to this topic. So let's, uh, let's give a big round of applause to the governor's office feel accomplished several ways, but today I feel more accomplished when you give a keynote with, uh, with another keynote given by the president of the same university you graduated from. You know, <laughs> I was there sitting, uh, you know, like a student when I, when I saw uh, Dr. Bosky, and now when, I, when I'm speaking with him, that's, that's uh, you know, uh, makes me well, honored, humbled, you know, it's, it's fantastic. 
And the third reason, I want to thank the organizers especially uh, because uh, you strategically placed my talk before Freeman's because if he had given the talk, he wouldn't have come for my talk actually, so, because I wouldn't have anything else to say. So don't give this talk, okay? So, uh, he's a phenomenal speaker. So, um, and now I want to, uh, my talk today is going to be about, uh, you know, uh, student engagement uh, in the classroom, outside the classroom. Uh, and uh, I actually, I want to start off with this because I speak for the USA Science and Engineering <coughs> Festival that happened recently. And what they did was, you know, just to promote the event, while this was in 2015, I speak almost every time they, they have the festival, they actually made these cards. And this was like baseball cards. So you can actually trade and say, hey, this is a mathematician, just like, you know, uh, instead of saying this is 0.363 or something like that, you know. He does math, he does this, and then someone else will trade a card for you. So they actually ran, like, you know, if you collect so many cards, then we give you a price. And so, you know, I thought it was so cool to actually connect the sports analogy to something as simple as that. And I'm going to talk about, you know, everything from learning by doing to experiential learning to uh, something I'm very passionate about, and I've had several students uh, work with me. And this, uh, you can already see uh, one of the global challenges that I was involved in, which is. Uh, uh, every 15 minutes an elephant is being killed. Uh, a rhino is being killed also uh, because for their, for their tusk, for example, the elephant, each tusk is about $30,000 in the black market. So how do we identify these poachers? This turned into a big STEM problem. I'm going to tell you the story later on, how we ended up uh, at least addressing some solutions for that. But I do want to start off with something uh, uh, on a note where uh, uh, we just heard uh, about the uh, you know the need for more computer science, uh, need for more underrepresented uh, you know students in STEM. So this is a big uh, you know passion for me to actually go after and try to give as much uh, you know cast a wider net and get as many students engaged. And it turns out that uh, it all depends on the philosophy of how we impart education. So if you actually take your cell phones or mobile, you know, and maybe we don't have time now, and just type, or in our favorite engine, search engine, which is, of course, Google. If you just Google, education makes me, what do you think will be the first response? Smart, interesting. I should really ask you to do it sometime. The first response is depressed. <laughs> I would also like you to type university makes me and see what it actually gives you. Feel like a failure is the first response. And I'm not kidding. This is Google. If Google, that is a big data mining, you know, is, that means you guys, the students are telling us, this is what you feel like. And let me explain why this is so important. Because we as educators, we are trying to think that we are doing such a great job. We are coming to the um, class every day and trying to uh, give you burgers. Burgers the next day, burgers on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. And so we think we are trying to do a really good job in pleasing you. And what's happening on the other side, you guys are sitting there and thinking, why is this guy not giving pizzas for a change? <laughs> That's all is the difference between teaching and learning, which are two sides of the same kind. Right? So, we think we are trying to give you everything that you want, but you're on the other side saying, come on, give us something different. Right? So, and this is uh, where I've put my heart on, and this is where all these different frameworks of learning comes in. And I'm going to share with you, the first part of the talk is going to be on what kind of competencies that you need to be ready with. In, and so, you know, uh, there's no class of mine where you don't... Uh, do work, okay? So you have to do homework with me. So what I'm going to ask you to do is uh, uh, just to demonstrate, maybe let me ask you, what do you think is the difference between a problem and an exercise? Uh, an exercise is to practice something that isn't come up, uh, like a problem is something like instantaneous, it happens when you face it face on, and exercise is a practice continue. That's fantastic. That's, that's exactly right. You know, if I train you to do something, you can, a robot can do it. So, fantastic job, okay? So, so, a problem is not something that you know the answer to, but someone else may know the answer to. Let me demonstrate, okay? Everybody, try to open your two hands straight, please. Everyone, put your right hand on top of the left hand, in case you didn't know, this is right, this is left, okay? So turn your hands, grab your 
grab your uh, fingers tight into you know class clasp like this. Open your thumbs, please. Open your pinkies, please. Uh, do what I'm about to do. Do not open your hands, but try to see if you can just turn and leave. Now, thank you very much. This is what I call my friends. Failure. Okay? This is exactly what I call failure. Okay, so. What I have not said here, and I'm going to try this all through my talk, but I have some examples. several things coming. So, just like she pointed out, if you go to the next slide, the, uh, so uh, a problem is something you ge you generally don't know the answer to. So if I ask like a uh, you know um, a middle schooler what is nine times seven, they should know what nine times seven is. But if I ask a you know second grader what is nine times seven, they may have to think. But you know what? I have fun teaching nine times seven to second graders. Open your ten fingers, please. Okay, nine times three. Let's say one, two, three. Bend your third finger. There's two on this side, seven on this side, twenty-seven. Let's go again. Nine times four. One, two, three, four. When the fourth finger, 36, oh okay? And so on. So now I just got a second finger. So, now, Actually, do you all hear me without the mic, or do I need to use the mic? I need to use the mic, okay. So, what I want to tell you here is that what is a problem to somebody, you know, could be an exercise to someone else. And what's an exercise to someone else could be a problem to someone else. So, I know that you're going to try everything that I'm doing. Everybody's playing with their hands, okay? More to come, more to come, okay? So, um, if we go on to the next slide, please. So, I'm giving you two minutes. Go ahead, talk to your neighbor and find out as many movies as you can. Go ahead. I'll give you two minutes. Two minutes, go for it. This is supposed to be a student talk, but I see like all the <laughs> faculty jumping in and all that. Let me start with the. Uh, can you tell us one of the names? Um, well, American Pie. American Pie, exactly. I think <laughs> everyone gets it. That's the longest mile, the, the meters. No. Which one? This one? You got that one? Mile. That's great. So, the, the funny, I mean, the most important thing is children, you know, this is in middle school, a mile is 1609.344, right? But it's in green, it's the green mile, by the way. Okay? So, so. I don't see too many. <laughs> so, uh, what else did you find? Anyone else? The first one? Yes. Matrix. A matrix, very good. So you see an array of, uh, you know, rows of numbers and columns of numbers. So it's an array. So it's the, uh, you know, uh, the matrix, the Keanu Reeves, uh, Fishburne movie, right? So, and what about you said American Pie? What about the third one? Science. Science. Very good. Night Shyamalan, who did the Sixth Sense. That's the second movie. So the signs, because each one is a sine wave. So it's four of them. So it's multiple. So it's signs. What about the fourth one there? It's girls. When you put that symbol, that's a sum. When you take one over n, that's actually taking the average. Average has another word, which is also called mean. So it's mean girls. Sorry, girls. Okay, so. Uh, this, of course, is, uh, you know, it's very, it's what is called as a complex number, but the eye is golden, so it's the golden eye. And, uh, wow. and then, of course, that's the James Bond, uh, uh, you know, and then this is, again, you already know this means sum, so it's the sum of all fears, okay? So that's uh, basically what it is. And that's uh, 13, and this symbol means? Floor. Very good. That's the 13th floor. Scary movie. So, uh, this of course is uh, an X. Awesome. This is a symbol for R. Exorcist. Okay. So, Exorcist. Okay. Sin City. Sin City. Fantastic. Okay. Awesome. Wow. So, this is, I haven't had so, I haven't had so many responses. Okay. What about this? It's a network of people talking socially. So that's the social network. Okay. 
this guy is sitting in uh, right now. No, Facebook is what I'm talking about. So, uh, of course, two times the number is even. Two times the number plus one would be, and there's two of them. So, oh, very good, odd couple. That is it. So, this is a very beautiful result in mathematics, and this is the number of the beast. That's the beauty and the beast. Okay, so. Uh, <laughs> As we do this, this is, uh, you know, I want to make it even harder. So those that are doing calculus, you may have seen, or, you know, this one here, S stands for displacement, DSDT stands for velocity. When I put a magnitude around it, it's called speed. Okay, Sandra Bullock and uh, Keanu Reeves. So, and then this, of course, is a harder one. It's called heat equation, so it's the heat. And this is my favorite, actually. Wow. 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 Very good. How do you do that? So somebody said, oh, I saw the number. I made the connection to the number. It's the Euler's number. And so it's 2.7 something. And then uh, the wall behind it, so it's wall E. Oh. So <laughs> what we just did, if you did not recognize, if you're in my classes, this is how I start my classes. If you did not recognize what I just did, it took me three minutes to get you through six steps. Concepts. Wow. Yeah. This is all about active learning, right? So how do you engage the audience? In my case, it's, it's the students, right? So I was not offering you burgers, right? That's the most, most important thing. Now, of course, when I see something like this, then I, uh, I, I want to go for, to the next slide. And then uh, I, I, I want to make stories with it, right? So if I want to know what is E, now, sir, I ask you what is E, because you recognize the number, but now I'm challenging you, what's E? Uh, Euler's number. Which is? Ah, so now, uh, it's amazing, sometimes our mind makes the connection to the number, then when I ask you to recite it, it's very hard to say. It's true. I have also have trouble. So what I do, I make a story, right? Uh, you can keep clicking uh, and I'll keep speaking. There's only two things you need to know about Andrew Jackson. Keep clicking. Uh, he was uh, the seventh president of the United States. He was elected into office in 1828. I repeat, 1828. Like every good mathematician should know, the angles of an isosceles right angle triangle is 45, 90, 45. Like I said, you just need to know two things about Andrew Jackson. And that's E for you. So, I just want to make sure you understand the first competency, learning from failure. Actually, can you go back for a second? Yeah. So, I'm going to go through, uh, actually, you could use the other one. That's fine. So, learning from failure, right? That's the first competency that I want. Failure is so important. I don't, I don't mean like keep failing every exam. <laughs> I meant like from failure you learn, right? And you can turn that into opportunity. So if you actually go to the next slide, there's a lot of people that have, uh, you know, uh, faced this. Einstein, failure doesn't mean you are a failure. It just means you have not succeeded yet, right? Uh, Lincoln, failure doesn't mean you haven't, uh, you have accomplished nothing. It just means you've learned something today, right? So uh, who knows that person there? Edison, right? If I ask you what did Edison do, what do you say? He found the ball, right? So nobody recognizes that he failed nine, 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 nine times. You know, he just found the ball the 10,000th time, right? But you, we all remember for the success, right? What about those failures he had that brought him to that, that ball, right? So, and of course, did you know that he was deaf? Yeah. yeah, so you know, failure doesn't mean you've wasted your life, it just means you have to start fresh, right? So start again. Of course, you know these two guys who always were, you know, promoting inspiration and all that. So, um, if you go to the next one, now I want to translate to something else. This I use for the ministries, governments, institutions, it's a fantastic approach. It's called the five whys, okay? And uh, it's actually introduced by the same person who invented Toyota, so Sakichi Toyota. And here's how he went. He did this every day in his office. Now, you, know, you can try it in the governor's office. You can try it. It's fantastic for organizational, you know, some question that you have uh, lingering. So, for example, the Washington Monument is deteriorated. You ask me why? Because they use harsh chemicals. Why would they have use harsh chemicals? Well, uh, because there must be birds dropping, right? So bird droppings, okay? Why do birds, uh, why do you have so many bird droppings? Because there's a lot of birds. Why do so many birds come? Because there's a lot of spiders they want to come to eat. Why, do, why are there so many spiders? Well, because there are lots of insects that the spiders are attracted to. Now, before uh, you do the next one, so they put a lot of money into actually uh, doing this. Like, you know, the Washington Monument was deteriorating and all that stuff. And you know what the answer was? If you say one more why, the insects were attracted to a certain light inside the monument. You know what the solution was? Change the bulb. Yeah. <laughs> you don't need million, million dollars for that. Just go and change all the bulbs, and then you back solve the problem. It's a fantastic approach, okay? So here's what I'm going to challenge you with now. So if you can turn to the next slide. Uh, more than half who start their studies in a STEM discipline that includes community colleges, uh, universities, all institutions, they end up switching their majors before the senior year. I want you to talk to your neighbor 
and challenge them to come up with five why's. So one of you play the uh, statement and the other person keeps asking why. Please go ahead. I'll give you two minutes. <laughs> Please try it in the corner. So I actually would like you two to stand up for a second, please. They did a fantastic job here. And so one person is going to play why. And uh, so here's the statement here, OK? So you're making the statement. And okay. go ahead. More than half, half who start their studies in a STEM discipline end up switching majors before their senior year. The five whys. Why is that? Because after they start, they realize that the math is really challenging. Why do they say that? Because they haven't had enough preparation in their foundation courses to do well in math. Why is that? They may not have had teachers who really knew how to teach them well. <gasps> Why do they not have teachers that knew how to teach them well? <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry. Oh, I have to look over there. No, no, I'm just saying. It's, it's the even worse. The teacher is more properly um, trained. <laughs> right. Because the teacher education programs didn't focus enough on how to teach mathematics. Why is that? Maybe we're not drawing the right skill set to teach math because we're not paying teachers enough. <laughs> what is called as a root cause analysis. So while they actually drove all the way towards, you know, um, teachers need to be enhanced, you know, like enhancing pedagogical practices, maybe continuous professional development is a solution. And then of course the salaries and all that stuff, that's related to the budget and things like that, right? Now if I ask students, I don't know, we don't have time too much, but it, the interesting thing about this is, you all would have gone in different directions. They went with the, they rolled with math here. Right, so I'm not sure if it's because I showed some math before, but uh, uh, but that's the idea. So this is a fantastic approach. Use it in any any organization that you work with, and it's called Five Wise. And it's a uh, so if you go to the next uh, next slide, uh, we don't talk too much in the classroom. We just you know, it's like like going on an elevator, just looking at each of those faces, and then getting down at your stop. Your classroom is like an elevator, right? So make sure. You know, you communicate, make sure the instructors let the students communicate. You teach less, they learn more. Why Singapore, Ministry of Education, if you go to Ministry of Education, why is Singapore on the top of the world? Because their ministry says, teach less, learn more. I wish ours was test less, learn more. Okay, so, uh, but, uh, but uh, you know, uh, if you look at these countries, I, I work for the, I mean, I'm actually, I serve in the National Academy of Sciences for Mathematics Instruction. My, one of the things I do is compare the curriculum across different countries. Finland, why is Finland doing so well? Because their philosophy is learning by doing. So everybody has already said, this is what we want to do. Okay, and they don't assess their children until sixth grade. They give 2.8 hours of homework every week maximum. When we give like 15 hours of homework, whatever, right? So, so there's a lot of differences in the way that uh, countries uh, work, right? So if we go on to the next one. How many squares do you see? Chessboard. How many squares? Too many, yes, but 64. The standard answer is 64, right? Because you're like saying eight. So now, so if you actually, oh, you see 65. So, you see, most of you actually saw the one by one squares, and, and then what you start, start to see is 65. Somebody saw the big square, but then isn't that a square? Ah, I see, so there's seven of them, and then isn't that a square? Oh, yeah, so. So what you quickly see is like there's a whole bunch of squares there, right? Which we tend to miss. And you'll see that it's it's got to do with one squared plus two squared all the way to eight squared and it has a formula. But my point is not to come into the class and say, today I'm gonna to teach a formula for the sum of the perfect squares. Instead I walk in with a chessboard and say, let's discover how many squares there are. It's just a reverse way of teaching, right? And then 
the children, the students, when I say children, I mean you. So you will discover those things. You know, it's a reverse backwards design, right? So it's teaching, okay? So this uh, skill is the next competency, critical thinking. I just asked you just what you just answered it like an exam, 64, 65. I could, have, I could have given you all those multiple choices, right? You would have fallen into each one of those traps. It just takes that extra competency called critical thinking, right? In fact, uh, what is happening there is uh, I have a middle school girls program uh, in, the, in the summer and the girls are actually, uh, there's a solar pump and the, uh, you know, they're trying to actually see how high the uh, solar, the water is coming and uh, Essentially, it's a solar, a little solar uh, panel connected to the pump, so the water comes out. And uh, I ask them, instead of uh, telling them what, what is happening, I ask them questions like, what if I cover the solar panel, half of it, what do you think will be the height of the water? What if I cover three-fourths of it, what do you think will be the height of the water? And we have to, it's an inquiry-based uh, approach to actually asking questions. And then, of course, I can say, what if I hold the solar panel, since we are inside the classroom, I'm, I'm having a bulb instead of a sun. What if I change the wattage of the bulb? 40 watts, 60 watts, 75 watts. What happens to the height of the fountain? So now, I'm not asking you like a very standard math problem. But in the background, I'm asking you to connect them using what is called as variations. Direct variation, inverse variations and all. I don't want to use those words. I want you to discover those things. Right? So that's the whole point. So another important thing uh, is this is very, very big. I mean, I'm very passionate about this one. And uh, as we just heard, you know, one in six STEM PhD load, uh, holders actually leave STEM. I'm actually, I mean, great. it's great to hear that Maryland is doing such a great job with doctoral degrees. But, you know, and this is more like one in five female STEM PhD holders leave STEM. This is really, you know, something that I wanted to uh, also work on. One in five uh, uh, black STEM PhD holders leave STEM. So how can we come up with some fixes? Well, I started something very simple. I brought uh, 18 girls uh, in the summer and we engage, immerse them in, uh, in uh, science first day, technology second day, engineering third day, mathematics fourth day, entrepreneurship, leadership, and the camp. And I just happened to invite the weather forecaster from NBC to talk about meteorology as a STEM field. And then she goes and presents that on NBC. And immediately, every, I started getting calls from everyone saying, how can we sign up for this camp? So, and then corporations asked, how can we fund this camp? You know, so, and then soon it now grew, grew to 100 girls. So every summer I have 100 girls coming and they go through this whole program. We have corporations that have already funded this, uh, are funding this every summer. But then these girls have been coming each year and the middle school girls are saying, now we are high school. What, what can you create for us? Well, like we created a high school academy. Immediately another organization said, well, we want to pick that up. What do we give them? Career choices research and those types of things and you can keep building on right and then I would love to uh, create uh, uh, something with uh, all the community colleges we can create a program which is going to be focused on something like I'm, I'm you know uh, let's give a big round of applause for the for the chair uh, chair uh, chair uh, uh, this is fantastic. I mean, that's the first time. I mean, this is really, uh, you know, when you have individuals at a high level invested in something so important, this, this is how we can get things done. So, so uh, the next uh, slide, please. So, here is another one, which is, uh, I have 30 circles, yes. Our director of the program is here. Ah. I think she's here. Richie Cuff. I'm sorry. Well, just left. that's great. When she comes in, we'll give her a big number. This is the type of initiative I would love to see uh, the states. In fact, let me tell you, I forwarded my uh, the talk uh, to the Virginia governor's office uh, yesterday, uh, and the person who was the STEM cabinet leader there, she immediately wrote back saying, "Why is Virginia not doing something like this?" I said, "Yeah, that's exactly why I sent it to you." So, you know, <laughs> so it's it's great to see these sorts of things. So here's a bunch of circles, 30 circles, and I'm asking you like. Uh, to think about, uh, if you go to the next slide, uh, uh, two minutes, uh, you know, I, I, I'm going to start saving time. If I were to ask you to fill these circles with ideas, just <coughs> all sorts of ideas, uh, what did you do? First thing will be like a writer's block, this will be like a drawing block. Wait, what should I draw in the circles? What, what, do you, what does he mean by ideas? And so, I'm not going to do this because we don't have paper and pencil, but uh, if you go to the next slide, I want to show you two possible solutions. One is uh, people that are fluent with ideas. You could have done this, you know, thousand of them. You all had the answer in your cell phones. It's all these emoticons, right? Sad face, happy face, you know, this face, that face. There's tons of them you could have drawn. That's a person that's very fluent. 
And there's another person who we call as flexible, the soccer ball, the tennis ball, the basketball, you know, making everything balls, or like the red, blue, yellow, and uh, you know, the light, the traffic light, and all this stuff. That is a flexible person. So this is the next competency that you need to have if you go to the next slide. Is, uh, and so there's one more problem. So if I ask you a question like, how many uh, piano tuners are in Chicago? You're like, what? What's he asking? Well, let me give you one more clue. Chicago has three million people. So now you're kind of like, okay, is that it? Yeah, that's all I'm giving you. So I could play prices right here and say, <laughs> start guessing. You wanna guess? Throw numbers, please. One. One. One piano tuner, okay? <laughs> okay. He's going to be the richest guy in the whole world. Okay, That's the three okay. million. Three hundred, okay? Three hundred. Thirty. Thirty, okay? Five hundred and ten, okay? Less than three million. Less than three million. Wow. Yeah, you don't get children actually work, okay? So, okay. So, let's, let's think about this, okay? There are three million people in Chicago. Let's assume that an average family, husband, wife, two kids, right? Four people. So if there are four uh, people in a family. How many families are in Chicago? Three million. I'm going to do some small math. So that's 750,000. Okay, so let's suppose that everybody cannot afford a piano. So every fifth house, let's say, has a piano. And you could change your assumptions. So if every fifth house has a piano, then 750,000 divided by five would be 150,000 pianos. Now let's suppose I'm a piano tuner. I, you know, go to this end of Chicago, then I go to another end of Chicago, and then another end. I can't do more than four jobs a day. Do you agree? And I can't then do about, I only work five days. I don't work on Saturdays and Sundays. I'm giving talks at other places, right? So, so I only work on five days. That's 20 jobs a week. And let's say for the entire year, that's 52 weeks. And I don't want to do 52 times 20. I'm going to make it, I'm going to take two week vacation. So that's 50 weeks times 20. That's 1,000 jobs, right? So 150,000 pianos, 1,000 jobs, so which leaves us with 150 piano tuners. Congratulations, you're the closest. So, okay, so, <laughs> okay. so what I did just now is a uh, problem-solving idea called Fermi problems. This is by Enrico Fermi, very famous physicist, who would start his classes like this. This is how he would start. But he had, a, he had an idea in mind. He had to teach a certain concept. So if we go to the next slide, if I ask you, how many popcorn panels can fill this room? <laughs> You're like, what? What's he asking? Well, if you start to think about it, if you actually, you don't want to do that, but if you go to the next slide, you know, maybe a popcorn kernel can fill, fit into a half inch by half inch by half inch. Now, if I go further, if I do a one inch by one inch by one inch, which will have eight, eight little cubes like that, so that's eight popcorn kernels, right? So, of course, if, I, if you know that uh, one foot has how many inches? Remember what I did when I said 52 weeks, I always knocked off the two and made a nice number like 50. I'll do the same thing here. Let's say a foot is about 10 inches, right? So now 10 inches by 10 inches by 10 inches would have 8,000 popcorn kernels. That's a good starting point because I know the measurement in this room as feet, right? And now I can actually do the math. So the whole idea and what do you think I'm teaching today out of this concept? The volume is my concept. I never told you I'm teaching volume today. But as a teacher, you're engaging them and then getting them to do something. That's the whole idea, right? And uh, it can keep going. So creativity. So these examples that I just said has to do with creativity in problem solving. Okay? So uh, I'm not sure how I'm doing on time. Uh, Twelve minutes. Twelve minutes. Okay. So and then the whole time we have been, we were doing collaboration. Okay. So it's about collaboration is is a key, and uh, that's teachers collaborating to do. Uh, you said you know this is one of my professional development workshops where all the math teachers are looking at uh, what is called as an oscilloscope, they're so excited, and Mike comes to these workshops and, and they're looking at graphs, and then I say, oh, put this little chip to your throat, and then start humming, and so they start, what are you doing? I say, yes, go ahead and hum, and you've never seen such good math, I mean, math teachers singing so well, and they start <laughs> singing, but what is interesting is those uh, singing becomes waves, right? And so they're so, I said, okay, can you sing higher, see what happens? Can you sing, like, for a long time, see what happens? And then I asked them to go outside, and Mike and I do this interesting show, where they come back inside, and we have a graph already on the screen. And then we challenge them, sing like the graph. And then they're like, wait, you mean, like, match the amplitude and the freak, I mean, all the pre-calculus things come out. I said, yes, that's exactly what we want to do. 
So then they realize, then I say, how do you teach this in class? Oh, we just write y equals to a sine co, you know, uh, bx plus c plus d, and uh, we just say, to find a, take these data, do this. It's like, a, I can program a robot to do this. Why are we teaching them, right? So, but if you do it this way, they make connections to the amplitude. They make connections to the vertical shift. They make connections to the parameters and what they're learning, right? That's the most important thing. So this is, a, so the teachers are very excited to do this. These are all math teachers, uh, if you keep going further. So all those competencies are going in the following uh, fashion, right? Here, here's you guys sitting there. Uh, if you click, uh, this is uh, students as consumers. We need to stop treating students as consumers. You're not here to buy something from us, okay? You're here to actually produce something for us, right? In fact, even better, you don't just produce, you actually serve as peer reviewers, right? So our job is to facilitate, not to stand there, show our backs and teach. Right, write stuff on the board. That's very important. This is for the educators here. Okay, so uh, so it's very important. How do we impart this most important thing? Is the 21st century skills. If you click on that, so it's basically you know the communication, the collaboration, the creativity, the critical thinking, everything that we talked about, including the failure. Okay, so uh, so now I'm going to switch gears and say, how can you actually really uh, take this to the next level? Well, the United Nations. Actually, so this is something all the students should really look forward to because I have a student going to the Capitol Hill next week to present one of their projects. Uh, and I'm going to tell you in just a second. If you are thinking of projects to do, please look at this. This is called the Sustainable Development Goals. Now, many states in the United States are trying to align themselves. Many countries are aligning themselves to what is called as SDG to 2030. These are 2030 goals. These were 2050 Millennium Goals. You know, poverty, if you look at number four, is quality, inclusive education, okay? Try to align some of the things that you're doing towards these things. It'll really pay off later on. You will see why. Not only will you be satisfied, you will be able to make a greater impact. The second important thing that I would like you to think about is NSF. When I just came out last year, uh, the NSF, they created what is called as 10 big ideas. This is for the faculty. If you write an NSF research proposal, make sure your first paragraph starts with aligning to one of these goals because that's super important and it's it's harnessing data you know working at uh, human technology frontier and so on and and then they have four process ideas and i love this one this is uh, including like nations diverse uh, and underrepresented learners so this is a really good program uh, this will be due next april and i really the, this is this cannot happen often all the community colleges that are here in maryland I will work with you on a session, you know, we'll sit down together and see how to go after this type of uh, project and all that stuff. So, you know, maybe another day, okay? So, and then the third one I want you to, uh, those that want to be engineers and you want to develop something for the future. The National Academy of uh, Engineering came up with these uh, 14 grand challenges. Everybody has to choose some number, you know. Yeah. They, they, you know, I don't know why 14, but uh, reverse engineering the brain, make solar energy economical. All these things are very standard. I mean, you and I could have just sat together and put this together in like, you know, one hour. But what was interesting is the program that they came up with. So any university that you guys are going for, now many universities in the United States have signed up to become Grand Challenge Scholar. They all have programs. So look for this program because if you join a university uh, from community college, if you're transferring to a university and you want to take that program, you want to get into that program, it's like the Honors College, but it's different because you will finish what is research, what is interdisciplinary, what is service learning, what is global, and what is entrepreneurship. And once you finish these five things in your degree program, you will be commended by the National Academy of Engineering, which is kind of, and National Academy of Sciences, and National Academy of Medicine. This is the highest, uh, you know, honor that you can get and all that, okay? So, we keep going. Um, and you can just, yeah, you can just click on, click on it. Yeah. So I want to. I wanted to play a quick uh, video. So this is my first uh, project from, uh, and I will talk. Yeah, just double click on it and full screen. Yeah. You may not hear, but uh, what is happening is basically uh, the poaching problem that I was telling you. These are poachers that are always on the lookout for, uh, uh, you know, for killing elephants and rhinos and all that. Of course, they have to take them down completely because these tusks go all the way back, and so you can't just have broken tusks. Nobody buys broken tusks. So, you know, so these, uh, uh, so you can see like, you know, 125 million dollars worth of stuff, and if you can. Uh, so the question was, I gave a challenge to students, and uh, I had a community college student also on this, what's the key to solving this problem? 
And uh, if you can pause that for a second. So, uh, and you can close it actually, you can close it and I'm going to talk about this. So, yeah. So, essentially this was a challenge and you know, how do you solve something like this? This is not something that comes in your textbook, math textbook. Yeah. This is a challenge, right? I mean, how do you solve this? Uh, and I can, I, and if you go to the next slide, so I am very passionate about these types of things, and there's a technique, there's a framework that I uh, that I really enjoy is called design thinking. Another one, just like the five whys. So this is where you first empathize with the needs assessment, do the needs assessment, and then you define all the problems, and then you go after the problem that you want to go after, and then you. Uh, come up with ideating all solutions at the third step and then you prototype it and test it so we actually uh, came up with a solution what do you think the solution for that identifying poachers would be what's that a billboard good solution but this is the Serengeti this is the wide open Serengeti so anyone else how do we go after the poachers? That's the question, right? Yes. So, well, instead of going after the poachers, why not just make the tusks undesirable? So now they have this thing where they just dye the tusks like this. This is a very good solution. And so, several people, of course, we have to yeah. go behind the elephants to do that. So that's a great solution that was proposed by several people. Anyone else? Give yes. So if you, if you can plot the the migration movements of the elephants, you can oh, find you so, the... So cool, okay, so migration movements, I love that. I, I'm thinking like, oh, I can model that, you know, so, uh, yes. Ask the police to become a pretend by. Okay, ask the police to become pretend by. This is great. So we did this, I took a bunch of students, I had a community college student also, so we went there and did all this stuff and uh, the solution turned out to be, uh, from the student in Puerto Rico, I took one, was like uh, drones. So drones to actually target, so it's a STEM solution. So if you actually go further. Uh, um, so this is another one, I want to tell you why design thinking is so cool. Uh, here's a, a California, so what, what happened was the children that are very afraid to, uh, you know, of ca you know, they are going for cancer treatment, they have to lie inside the MRI, uh, uh, you know, they are so afraid that they feel like they are going inside something very dark and all that stuff. So one of the hospitals decided to make it like a pirate uh, thing, right? So you come in and you get a ticket to go in and uh, you're going inside the whole pirate ship and all this stuff, you know? So it became a, it won the design thinking challenge actually. So it's about recreating, redesigning the whole experience, right? So human-centered approach to problem solving. If you are thinking of something to do, think of this design thinking as, a, as an option, okay? Go ahead. Uh, so this was kind of the solution that we came up with and now we have a, so like a drone tracking and all that stuff, uh, you know, and uh, uh, if you go further, uh, and this has got lots, it's a very rich STEM problem because there's a lot of STEM in it, you know, actual uh, content that you can learn, there's lots of policy there, that's my PhD student uh, who's finishing his uh, drone there and that's the Vice Chancellor who's uh, reports to the Vice President of the country. So if you go, if you go to, to the next slide, uh, and STEM education, right? So I just want to flash. I'm not, I'm not kidding. I'm not just saying, you know, oh, we use drones. We actually did some mathematics. If you go to the next one about mechanics, we actually, you know, you need to know where if a drone is looking at an, an animal or a ranger or a poacher. Right? That's probability. In middle school, you learned what is called as conditional probability. If she tells me, one ranger tells the other ranger, hey, I think there's a poacher there. So that's given the information that there is a poacher in that area, what is the probability that the drone is looking at a poacher? So we use those things and all that. So if we go further, and uh, I work very closely with lots and lots of uh, countries. Africa is one of them. And I'm hoping, uh, you know, some of you will get to go uh, in, a, in a future trip also. But what is great about these uh, country problems are it's from their heart. They, they, they don't like uh, uh, come and ask the professor for a problem. They give you the problem. And that is the challenging part of the faculty. So if you actually go further, uh, and I'm going to finish. And then I work with several countries. So I'm really looking forward to, I would love a network like this to actually form something, an alliance, where we can actually create uh, uh, international programs. So I'm going to finish with two, uh, just some opportunities for the students. Uh, we can, I, I have, I would try to bring this into higher education. I can go to the next slide, please. Uh, we have tried to actually work on a solar project. You know, people go and lay these solar panels on the roof, and they just come back and say, we did a great job, right? But the sun moves, right? Is your solar panel giving them, when I ask that question, they say, oh, no, no, the engineers are taking care of it. Yeah, but I asked the engineers too. They're, and so what, what is the natural solution? That's fantastic. So, that's the thing. What, what if the solar panel moves and that's the stem, right? I look for those types of 
uh, you know, chances. So go, go further, please. Uh, so I'm going to actually uh, skip this because of time. So the next, uh, I can give you my slides. Let me just... Uh, uh, oh, where's the time? Oh. I'm going to finish uh, uh, with my final thoughts because... So this whole... Uh, yeah, I can do this. This is fine. So the whole thing from... You know, it's okay. I don't know. I'm just going to... Uh, no. So this... Uh, uh, another thing I'm very interested in is infectious diseases. So uh, we actually wrote the first model for uh, Zeke. Oh, on the screen, of course. That's what you're asking. <laughs> no, I wanted to just go further. Okay, so we did some mathematics with Zika. I just want to tell you, this project is going to the White, I mean, White House and the Capitol next week. Uh, I want you all to think about this. There is an event called Posters on the Hill. So my student will come from Puerto Rico to present this. And what, we, what he wanted was, he wanted to solve the problem of gang violence in Puerto Rico. When, when he asks, uh, when a student like that asks a mathematician or a computational person, I usually don't know what to do. So I'm like, okay, let's try to solve this together because you know more information than me. And so luckily, the student that did Zika project with me was sitting in my office. I, I nicely snuck out to get coffee. I came back. Fantastic. Students, you know, teaching students. That's the best thing for faculty, right? So this is an example that's going to the, the Capitol Hill next week. So I want to finish with my final thoughts. Science, scientists are always inquiry-based. And uh, they're always after the question. Engineers are always uh, design-based. They're always after the problem. And it's okay for making a small bridge and breaking it. In science, you don't do that. You don't play with microscopes like that, right? So, but, uh, but it's very important to have this inquiry-based approach and the design-based thinking together to really come together, okay? So the next one, next one is, uh, you know, so you can skip this. This is what I just talked about. And, you know, STEM is really cool, uh, you know, for all sorts of reasons. And then one more slide. And I'm, I'm happy to... Uh, well, uh, uh, I'm happy to talk to you about very specific scholarships that is from the NSF. That's uh, called uh, Graduate Research Fellowships. Many of you want to probably go for higher level fellowships. One thing I really want to do is to uh, have some kind of a community college alliance created in Maryland to take you from here all the way to doctoral studies. Mm -hmm. So what's the pathway we need to create in chemistry, in math? So I think there's several leaders here, including members from the uh, governor's office. Thank you for listening to me. Thank you. Thank you very much, Padu. Like I, like I said, we're going to be charged up after his talk. And um, following up on his talk, in about 10 minutes, our sessions are going to get underway. I do want to acknowledge a few individuals who've been able to join us today. Here in the front row, we have Dr. James Ball, who is the president of Carroll Community College. And Dr. Rose Mintz, who's the vice president of academic affairs at Carroll Community College. And Dr. Sylvia Rochester, who's the Vice President of Academic Affairs at Baltimore City Community College. And Dr. Lance Brown, the Dean of Science and Technology at Anne Arundel Community College. So again, thank you very much. Could we give Padu another round of applause? Padu is going to be hanging around for a bit, and you all would like to speak with him about some of the opportunities he might have. I'm going to be here. Yeah, this side. Come on. At this time, we're going to move on to our first round of sessions. They are actually in your program book. And um, uh, later on this afternoon, before we gather back here, the part of the keynote session this afternoon will be right here in the same space. Does this gentleman here work in our math teacher? We need you. Absolutely. So just tell me, and we'll Definitely. make a few come together with this. So many grant opportunities also at the NSF. We should to work in my fingers don't move the right way for my shoulder. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're welcome, you're welcome. Yeah. My name is Padu Seshair. I'm the Associate Dean for the College of Science in George Mason University in uh, Fairfax, Virginia. And uh, one of the things I'm extremely passionate about is STEM education. And uh, when we talk about education, uh, as uh, as educators in a university or educators in community college or education educators in any system, we 
value student learning and we go over and beyond sometimes to do anything we can for students to learn a concept better. When doing that, we think sometimes students as consumers, but really students are not just consumers, they are actually producers of information for us. And they are not only producers of information, they are also peer reviewers. And uh, the best way to impart education is to actually work with them and uh, be able to incorporate 21st century skills, including critical thinking, creativity, collaboration, communication, and also help them learn about the value of failure as an important pathway to success. You had an incredible crowd out there. You even had people from higher education. How, was, how important was it to have the lieutenant governor here? Uh, as I mentioned in my talk, when a conference has people beyond just educators and students and university administrators, uh, in this particular conference, when I saw distinguished members from the governor's office be present, uh, that tells me and everyone else how invested the governor's office is in a topic such as STEM. Is America in trouble? around the world when it comes to STEM, or are we leading? Uh, actually, uh, every uh, few years, there's an international standards assessment uh, test that's given across the world. About 70 countries take it. Believe it or not, uh, uh, the US actually stands 25th in mathematics, 26th in science, and around the same place in reading. And if you look at the countries that are on the top, these are Singapore, South Korea, uh, Finland. Uh, in fact, this, this year, there's Estonia, such a small country. And you start to wonder, what are these countries doing that is different from what we are doing? So for example, Singapore, the Ministry of Education, their main goal is very simple, teach less, learn more. If you go to Finland, their slogan is learning by doing. So if we start to uh, focus on not just uh, you know, delivering content, but start delivering competencies, uh, the education can become much more interesting, both for the student and for the faculty member. Girls, STEM, <sighs> how important, there has been a growing trend of more women in STEM, partly because of your program. How important is it to get more well, we know about diversity, but more women in particular. Absolutely. I think uh, women and underrepresented minorities is uh, something that every state, every country should focus on, especially the United States. And uh, uh, we could do this very strategically and identify which areas that, uh, that we lack uh, women in. For example, computer science, engineering. And these are areas that we can definitely get girls involved. Think about the toys that we give as parents to our children. If it's a boy, and there is a study that is done uh, on this, uh, boys are usually given video games. They already learn about strategies and things like that. But girls uh, are given Barbie dolls. And so they get this passionate side of, uh, uh, you know, as they are learning and growing. So it's very important to not distinguish, you know, uh, uh, the type of uh, tools that we give them to enjoy learning. Uh, you know, so and then finally, um, yeah, I guess that's. The last question is um, Baltimore City. Riots, I'm um, known for riots, but there's a diverse amount of students in Baltimore. What can we do about increasing maybe the number of students in underprivileged neighborhoods in STEM? What can be done about that? Yeah. So I think uh, the best way to engage students of uh, who into a subject is to go through a paradigm shift of teaching them using the standard approach that we all tend to do is here is the mathematics go solve the problem here is the physics go solve the problem here is the engineering go solve the problem if we can change that philosophy to here is the problem let's find the math to do it so here is the riot problem let's say here is the gang violence problem let's find the math to do it and the kid who always wanted to do mathematics or chemistry or whatever it's the challenge to the instructor to somehow change the philosophy from here is the STEM subject, go solve the problem, to here is the problem, let's find the STEM to do it.
I'm from Carroll Community College, uh, as is the famous Razakan. <laughs> you all know Raza, and uh, you don't say no to Raza. So we uh, <laughs> suggested that we use this opportunity for all of you coming together uh, to have a conversation this morning about how we can work together and support each other in STEM related initiatives. Uh, in this case, specifically talking about how do we work together to ensure that we can offer our low enrolled courses and programs to students so that they can continue in their in their STEM career. So I hope you're fired up from this morning's speaker. I thought it was just really wonderful and perhaps set the stage in a night with the chief academic officers on a monthly basis and we talk about concerns that we all have. And this is one of the things that does come up from time to time. How do we continue to offer really high quality courses that our students need when we have sometimes a handful of students who need those particular 200 level courses? I think about 30 every year, at least about 30 in the and 40 this year. So this is the semester of age 20. So about 40 and we, we yes. So that's how many uh, I guess people are graduating in your program. Yeah. So I do want to remind that there is certain but you who want to read and ask her how her internship experiences and what she's looking forward to because she's almost about to finish it. Yes, so I'm going to be finished with the certificate program with both lab animal science and biotechnology in about a few weeks um, in May. You so, started in January. Yeah, I started in January. Um, I was so fortunate to get placed like instantly um, in, for my internship. Um, and so my internship is like exclusively basic research, which is exactly what I want to do. So, um, I remember my first day, my PI just like handed me a stack of articles to read, and I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> um, so, but he uh, treats us definitely. The yeah. research building was actually named after her. Up next, we have Grace Hopper, who was born in 1906. She's a, a computer programmer. And she has her doctorate in mathematics. She taught at Vassar College. Um, and during World War II, she decided to join the Navy. And in the Navy, she was able to work with the MARC computers, MARC I, MARC II, MARC III, which were the first like industrial computers. And she actually knew them so well, she wrote the 500 page manual for each of these computers. So she knew them inside out. And something very interesting about her is that with these computers, one time they shorted out. And she found them all from the system that caused the problem. So she, people say that she coined the term a computer bug. So, <laughs> um, like I said, she worked with the Mark computers. She worked on oversaw programming for the Univac computer, which is the first all electronic computer. Um, so, um, just a little bit about us. Maca is Mac plus AR. Combine social, mobile, analytics, analytics cloud-based solutions with this great technology of visual discovery, augmented reality. And one of them is education, We're talking to a lot of educational institutions and how AR can benefit the student community, the teaching, the faculty. So what we have so far in the last two years, we've built up an app called Smacker, which is available in the store. It's a free app. Yeah. I sent it in the morning because I was confused. I was told you weren't here, but then somebody else told me you were here. So, these regards, no, 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 no. because I asked what more you had, but then, you uh, know, so yes, yes. 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 Oh, my job. Um, this is not awkward at all. Okay, so I was a positive and I'm probably cool my job. The, um, the proteins... Oh my gosh, no, I'm like, no. You're good, you're good. You're good. You're good. Okay, so I was a positive and I'm probably cool my job. Smaller proteins are faster than larger. In the next stage, the proteins are transferred to a nitrocellulose membrane using an electric current. This maintains the size distribution of the proteins. Finally, antibody-antigen interactions and colorimetric imaging are used to identify the proteins. Hey. Yeah, those, yes, yeah, I don't know how those are going to be distributed, that's not... Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> 
I think we should this is incredible event. What are your thoughts? How special is this to you? What's that? How special is this event? It's very good. Yeah. And which because you play? Um, I'm a steering committee member. I was in the proposal committee. I'm, I'm doing everything. And it's an awesome event. And I'm very glad that we are all, you know, get together and do something for the STEM. And what's your name? Shamala Sivalingam. I'm from Anna Arundel Community College. I'm a professor. on the rotation curves that I was talking about, and velocities and gravitational lensing, you've got hypothesized dark matter clouds on either side, but that is colored in based on science. Again, you can't actually see dark matter. So now that we've explored space, we've, as I said, often thought to be a universal constant. You can't slow down time for the first time. But there's time dilation. Okay. The loudest person. Give it, give it to me. Give it to my. Oh, no. I called yeah, really in all pictures. Yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> the grad program for Cortex, I think that's the one for you. Yeah, yeah so you I'll send it to you. And it, no, no, yeah. 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 That one is <laughs> Notice how small it is. Okay? Alright, so when you're using the bitmap export function, it's different than when you're using the plot of a bitmap. The file is actually larger, yes, it's actually it's larger, but the problem is that you've got a file size issue when you do an export. It comes here and very important as far as what file program is. Right? Now, let's go the third way. know that is it, right? is it communication is it getting it out there is it all of the same oh you you know you have that I didn't know that I so did you know he had you know, right. Maryland online type thing I, you uh, know. we used to have a um, the calculus is used to be one of the uh, faculty who are can do um, but now he retired and we don't have a actual he, he hasn't offered it to Maryland online in 10 years mm -hmm. before he retired so yeah you know, but even in this room, there are some folks very new to Maryland who yeah. may not even know what Maryland Online is. So should we back up a minute and, and at least oh, explain yeah. the, the premise? I'll be joining Maryland Online this year. Uh, that's the conference in June and I'll be attending. So I'm pretty new, yes. Right. So Maryland Online is an organization for uh, online offerings, but I think in this case we're talking about the particular way that courses can be offered. Do you want to talk a little bit about how you, how it works? Or do you know? Well, I mean, I can I'm jump not, in if you... I know from 20 years ago. I haven't kept yeah. up on it yeah. since then, but you could offer, any, any student in the state could take it through there and I don't Procedure. know the details Procedure. of how they got oh, credits. Right. Through their home institution? Yeah. yeah, but you had to have buy-in from the home institution. Yes. So mm -hmm. just because you as a school want to put your course into the Maryland Online pot, um, and then it would be that the other schools would say, okay, we're going to list this course in our catalog. Yeah. <laughs>
cells that had been transformed but not induced. We wanted to make sure that our cells were doing as we wanted to and not just producing GSC on their own. We then have our lanes 3, which is food lysate with a combination of our soluble and insoluble fractions. And as you can see, very dark, thick veins, which indicated a lot of protein was being produced. We then separate them into the soluble or the supernatant, which is lane 4, and the insoluble or the resuscited color, which is lane 5. We still had some GSC in our insoluble fraction, but for the most part, the thick band was in our supernatant. We also had um, to test out whether a different optical density of cells produced more protein. We tried four different optical 0.6, 0 0.8, and 1.0. However, we didn't see much of a difference, so we went on to see maybe when we tried purifying it, it would produce different results. And as we can see, even with the different card, once you know two cards, you know the third card has to be. It's two purples already, so it has to be another purple. They're both they're, um, different shades, but it has to be solid. You don't find the card you need over here. Can it be this with this? So I need to find a red three solid oval. I don't see. So thinking like that, you can really cut down the possibilities. Yes? Uh, I was thinking. So the first one is diamond. So uh, if you take a look at the uh, third group, most of them are diamond. And yep. there's just two beans if we say those are beans. So, so is that diamond in one of these? So, so you none have of the diamond di here, and there isn't any. You're not gonna have a lot of cases at once. So you know the diamonds are not the choice because yep. the first choice is diamond. Yep. So you so, just the beans. Yep. There is no set in this one. In the game, you deal three more cards then, and then try to find them. Then. Okay. So the rules. You deal out twelve cards. You look for... Yeah, kind of yeah, we can, put our, our do you want to push the tables back yeah, and just have a chance for us? Yeah, that's what I meant. Thank you. And we can sort of... I'll facilitate it. I'm not I'm just having a conversation. Yeah. 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 So one of the, my question was, let me get it, if I can find a way around now that I'm stuck outside, yeah, I'll go over Since we're tied up over there, I'll squeeze through. So my question was, and this was as a direct result of um, a lot of my female students, well how do you feel when you enter the classroom and, and one instruct one student said to me I feel isolated I walk in and there might be one other female student and I sit down and, and the other thing she said to me and this was, she was actually one of the original members of the group she's since graduated and works at the applied physics lab for Johns Hopkins now as a community college grad she already had a, another degree but she changed careers she said I feel like all the male students know everything, and I said, they don't. I see all the grades. They don't know everything. Believe me. Believe me, you're the best student in my class. And, but the, there's a sense of uh, when women w come in, they feel like they already need to know what the course is, and that's kind of... Deborah, Joy, okay. Are you from, and also like which schools? Um, for me, I feel it's the way the society has made it look like. Because you, it's like, this is meant for the woman. It's like the society has made, that, made it like, this job is meant for the man. And this job is meant for the woman. Like, a woman decided to go into civil engineering or robotic engineering, a man may just come up to her and say, why are you in this major? Why are you in this course? Because to them, they feel, or like a, or like a man in, in, in nursing, they feel nursing is meant for women. You understand what I'm saying? So, I think, 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 I think
Yeah. Yeah. That, okay. Which, which All right. So let's so start. So, 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 oh my God. How do you feel when you uh, enter the classroom and you're male dominated? I love it. I love it. Okay. Okay. You can speak to it a lot. So we have to provide context. So why do you feel that way? Because okay. So I'm an electrical engineer major, and last semester was when I started at actual electrical engineering courses. Last semester I had two engineering courses. Both of them I was the only female. This semester I'm taking another one. One of them I'm the only female. Other one. I want our Skype. If you have Skype, it's much easier. So, guess what is the. Are we supposed to look busy? Oh, that's not my. Uh, oh, this yours? No, no, this is not. My poster is that one. Oh, wait, let's see. That one, this one. Uh, just point to it like you explained. All right, all right. Quick. You don't want to explain. You can say a couple of quick things. Uh, oh, yeah, sure. So, this is uh, the project is called Vegetative Propagation. And what I basically did is wanted to know how fast leaves could uh, propagate, how fast they can grow them, because they are uh, they're used for medical purposes, they're used for. Um, or oh, at your home you can uh, use them to make, um, you know, facial mascara to make, you know, a nicer, uh, clearer skin. Good. We changed the color. No, the color. The, the color. Okay. Did you want us to explain Did something? You know all that? It is. Just say something. All like this. So this is a poster. Okay. So, um, in this um, research study we had uh, BCCC students come for sessions to, um, Collect. We showed them how to collect their own DNA from their own saliva, and then we used their samples to um, run a PCR. Uh, so this, is, this is also me. Oh wow! Yeah. So, um, so in this poster, we were researching biofuel. We were trying to introduce a new gene into algae so that it would produce more um, biofuel. So, yeah. <laughs> Maryland Collegiate STEM Conference, Baltimore City Community College has about 60 students and faculty present here, which is probably one of the largest ones. And from the Biotech Club alone, we have seven posters and two presentations, one in the morning and one in the evening. So I think we have a huge presence here, and I think our students are doing a fabulous job in STEM. And it's really, I think of it as I feel like a lot of other courses could also do with this more, aside from just teaching, just like Dr. Panu was saying, aside from just teaching, why not finding or giving time for students to express their interest in something, and then working with them to kind of give them the chance to do their own experimentation and kind of work through it. That way, not only are you learning something, Professor's also learning something. Or, you know. So we have like 
three fast minutes for questions. Yes. All right. Um, I was interested. I'm here also. Just shout. Right, I was interested in this presentation with these circadian rhythms. So I was thinking about the sun, right? Have you ever heard about sun gazing? Pardon? I'm sorry. Sun gazing. Have you ever heard about sun gazing? Sun gazer? Sun gazing. Sun gazing. That's correct. I, I'm not All right. So there are yogis, right, in India, who they have observed over time, who don't eat. They get their energy directly from the sun. And they observe these people. You can Google it. Okay. Right? And that's sun gazing. Sun gazing will come, right? Okay. So I was wondering then if that has something to do with the whole circadian sort of rhythm. And if that has ever been investigated at all. To whether it has to do with circadian rhythms or not, but I will look that up. Sun gazers. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so if a child was born into a dark cave and never introduced to light, would they still have that that rhythm? Because uh, if you was experienced light before and then you go into darkness, haven't your body already? Um, uh, been uh, accustomed to the cycle of night and dark. So if you was never introduced to dark, would your body have that accustomed to say, well, this is night and this is dark of a, of a time cycle? Okay, so because that's plants, interesting. Because plants run on, uh, when the plants flower is 12, 12, when it's budding, I mean, when they're uh, vegetative, it's like 18 hours of light. Totally different that Any other questions? Slightly over. Okay? <laughs> 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 And, and they'll give you the answers. Okay, let's go back up. Let's, uh, any calculus people in here? Anybody mm -hmm. do calculus? Good. What happens if you integrate a straight line? What do you get? Mm -hmm. The straight line represents the slope. Yeah, you get a parabola, yeah. So if you, if you take the slope of a problem, you're going to get a straight line. So if you integrate a straight line, you should get a problem. Well, let's type in a straight line. Let's not write that out. Let's do integrate i and z y take the integral y equals minus 10x plus 50. It's got 10 seconds, 0 and 10 seconds are the roots, and the 5 seconds is the, the, the vertex, it goes up to 125 feet. And there's the parabola, that's the projector that's launched it. This is a projector that's launched at 50 meters per second. It goes up here at 5 seconds and then free falls. I'm glad you are
in the lab working on like our calculations and then uh -huh. that night we're like oh you can measure this with the what was it the red temperature oh yeah like the car the car no efficiency yeah. so we had to go back to the lab the next day and fix it and then we had to like at the ruler to try to like get the because you know you want to get the exact reading and uh, yeah it was really annoying we were so glad on the um okay so my husband is was well, he still is an engineer but he's retired um and he worked on NASA and Noah and he worked on a hydrogen hydrogen but it was like the most accurate time people like yeah it's like this big over at NASA mm -hmm. and um, he said hey why don't you you know um, why don't you uh, apply mm -hmm. you know because you you have a science background here but and, and I was like oh, okay. it doesn't matter right it's because you've developed those practices of thinking and analyzing that make you valuable in a variety of settings but he made me aware that oh no you don't just have to be an astronaut to work at NASA. Right. He said, I'm a chemist, I work at NASA. Yeah. He said, but we also have seamstresses. Yeah. We have janitorial services. Yeah. We have, you know, she's like, no, NASA. <laughs> <laughs> BCCC, Baltimore City Community College. Oh, nice, nice. Are you planning to transfer anywhere? Yeah, I'm, I, I got a dimension into JH and Towson. Wow. Oh my, good luck, good luck. Yeah. We're not yet. Okay, um, so in organic chemistry, you often use a technique called um, IR spectroscopy, which is used to measure, um, it's, it's technically you're measuring the vibrational modes in molecules. The atoms and molecules are not stationary, they move. Um, IR spectroscopy is one way we can measure that. Raman spectroscopy is another, somewhat less common way. 
Um, almost every organic class talks about IR spectroscopy. Raman is a complementary technique to it. Um, so basically, some things show up in the IR, um, and, and some things don't show up in the IR. And for trying to measure those things that don't show up in the IR, generally they will show up in the Raman. So. so this semester here at Howard Community College, and last semester, I wanted to take a look at our stream's health to see if they were being affected by human activity or if they were healthy. And I also compared what I was finding to previous data. And um, basically, overall, our streams here on campus and in Howard County have not been rated as healthy, they've been rated as unhealthy or poor. So that means we really have to find out what's causing these issues. So especially point to stuff, just right. like, just showing stuff. <laughs> so really, I don't hear you, I ain't gonna hear you. So um, we really also have to find out why our conductivity levels in these streams are so high. They're right around 2,000, and they... I don't want to explain it, but it's like, we did the effects of um, words. Not everyone's here right now, but it's fine. Um, service animals on like students in the classroom and how, like, if their size or type like affects the people that are there. Okay, so like, we had different surveys and stuff, and then our results were the different, like, biases were with, there was more bias with men versus women, and different bias between uh, genders and... Yeah, exactly, yeah, they do. Yeah. What's going on? Um, so, over the past semester, we've been working through a bunch of trials of aspirin, trying to just improve the way that we do, uh, the way that we are able to get the aspirin, right? So, um, so kind of what we've been doing is varying just small parts of the trial and trying to see how that affects the result of the aspirin that we're getting, like the purity and the percent yield. Um, you point to different things. I'm just getting, I can't hear you say it. Yo, okay. So just act like you're yeah. stuff. Show me. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. This is melting time, right? So we want to get as close as to 135 as we can. And essentially, if we get it around 135, we know it's pretty pure aspirin. And that's what we're shooting for basically throughout our experiment. And then you do something. So this is, um, this is our data sheet of the 33 trials that we have done so far. Um, the, we, assume we, are, we have changed the three different um, uh, three different of the uh, from the original procedure the uh, variables the first one we changed was the temperature of how how hot we are heating the uh, the solution the second one, Yo, you see good say something so uh, this is our raspberry pi for the our project so our entire project is called the campus sensor network so one of our major, we have three major goals. And the first one is to be able to collect data, such as you know the temperature, pressure, and humidity. And the second, the first thing we did was we set up the operating system for the Raspberry Pis, um, and then we set up a VNC viewer that allowed us to connect to the Pis uh, remotely, um, but have a secure connection. Um, and then third thing we did, we set up the sense hats. The sense hats record the environmental data like the temperature. And Excellent. Oh, yeah, good. Point at certain things in the future. Okay. So in, in order to complete our project, we have to connect our multiple pies together. So we chose to use the server and client connection so the pie can talk to each other. And then we set Successfully set up the uh, website, which like we can upload our. Well, I'm assuming that's not yours. So. No, he's not mine. Eighty. Let me see that fly. I had to put a puppy on there because everyone. This is very important. Okay. So what is this? Kick the ballistics. Go. So this is my poster, and it's about the three experiments that we developed for Freddie Community College using the X-ray fluorescence and spectroscopy. And the three experiments are for general, uh, for geology, general chemistry, and physics one, the physics two that we're gonna develop. So how is this gonna work? Is that we use the X-ray fluorescence and spectroscopy, which is the instrument. Point to a couple things. Yeah, it's the instrument, 
and it's going to use x-rays to identify the elements. For example, in the general chemistry, we're going to solve the different solvents and then using the solids that we're going to make, and then we can identify what's the identity of the solids using the x-ray fluorescence. So for example, in here we can see that the solids is actually aluminum nitrate and we Disrupted their diet. Um, the mushroom extract um, has a few combinations of the bacillus and the bacteria. Is it relaxed? And it also has a little bit of You can see them here. Um, the bacillus can Mushroom extract can work with bacteria. That's on the website and an internship that we have to do. Some things on there. Let me see if you know some things. 
All right, where's the uh, United States, Mika? Oh, we're talking about video here. It's right there? Okay, cool. Do you know? We're looking to it. I don't know if you can start doing it. Do you, saw, do you see something in there, Mika? And, and then look at me and wave. And oh, then do you look see back that? at it. And look at me and wave and then look right back at it. And look right back at it. Good shot. Because she can help you figure out like where things are going to match up and where things may not match up as good. Okay. We also have a lot of students who transfer in to our information. This book. We got this from Jones Force, and this is basically a sample. And these are our weekly observations. So this is what we want to get yeah, to everything. And every, so this is where we got the stuff from. <laughs> Thank you. Hi. Let me say mine. You can say yours. Go for it, Joy. Side, yeah, on the side, okay. This is just how microorganism develops and it develops over a week. So we'll put it in a, in a, in a column, you have to see how everything develops. We have the one for the control, the carbon and the sulfur, and the one with carbon and sulfur. Good. But yeah. Dr. Malaki. Young's is that like y'all talking amongst each other, I'm just going to pay it. We're bragging on our students, <laughs> even at the best detail. Yeah. And these are nice because um, yeah. even students can read the additional faculty. Two is by arts, two are on the university, and they have two. Thank you, I'm Thank honored you. to be here. We have water and a glass of ice at the podium Great. for you. Great, that's fine. Is there anything else that you would like? No, a copy of my book, Pie. You want a yes. copy? I'll get a copy of the book. Okay. See you. How are you doing? I'm sorry to make you run like No, and the GPS took me to the back rows <laughs> to the uh, West Gate or something. I was lost. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming. Thank you very much. Hello. Hello. I am delighted to be here. I think I learned a lesson about STEM on the way here. I spent the morning with about 2,000 people, a lot of families uh, of students who are seriously considering coming to UMBC in the, in the fall. And I, I was uh, using the GPS system, Howard Community College, right? <laughs> and I was kind of mindlessly moving along. And I first ended up in a residential community. Um, I really did. It's very interesting. And then I, I used Siri. Siri was very dependable. And she got me here, but to the west gate, to the back of the campus. I've never been to the back of the campus. I was told to stop using common sense. Give, com give common sense a round of applause. Common sense. You got to use it. You just cannot, you know? Because every now and then it's wrong. The technology doesn't get it right, right? It's very important. I, I begin with um, a, a story about my own childhood. The book that we wrote in the last couple of years, my colleagues worked with me on this, is in call, entitled Holding Fast to Dreams. Can you hear me in the back? Can you hear me? The wonderful two-year institutions. And you, I hope you know that half of Americans now start in two-year colleges. Give community colleges a round of applause for what they do for America. think about, if I asked you now to tell me your story in an elevator speech in two or three minutes, what could you tell me? And that would mean whatever it is that's important about you that led you to be able to be here today, your, your parents, your grandparents, whether you came from another country. How many of you have a parent or a grandparent from another country? Let me see your hand. It's very powerful. Always very powerful. The, uh, about 45% of my students. The world changed dramatically after the mid-60s. Now, let me ask you a question. How many of you had not even been born in 1965? Raise your hands. That is disgusting. I want you to <laughs> How many of you were at least in the world by the 1960s? Let me see your hands. Thank you for helping me out. Thank you so much. I appreciate that, all right? So here's what I want to say. Um, what we don't realize is that Getting more students into STEM is related to getting more students into college and to getting AA and bachelor's degrees and beyond. But what we don't realize is that the world has changed dramatically since the 60s. Now, one more question. The president of Stanford asked all the college presidents at a meeting, how long do you think college students can concentrate, focus on a lecture, before they begin to fade? What do you think the answer is? Let me hear. What, Ten minutes. Twenty. Five. So some of them, you've already made it out, right? You're, you're, <laughs> already, you're not listening to what I say, right? Well, the answer is actually only eight minutes. 
Now, the neuroscientists, I, I work with people at NIH all the time, how long can anybody, how long can the provost or whatever, whoever the person is, how long, the, the, the professors in here, how long can anybody focus without fading away? What do you think? I mean, just focus on the lecture, though. Focus on the lecture. The maximum is about 20 minutes. Now, it doesn't mean that after two minutes you don't come back to it, but you just think about something else. You think about what you got to do this afternoon, you'll be glad when this is over, or whatever, right? Why do I tell you that? What you're going to hear me doing in the next few minutes is a kind of interactive approach. I'm going to ask you questions, and I'll talk. Because if I just talk, a lot of people will just fade out. So here's the question. You know you will. Uh -huh. But you know how to look like you're still listening to me. I know how to, uh -huh. But I know you. I got some UMBC students over there too. Uh-huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> Listen, here's a quantitative background. But, but also, basic things. The microphone, the, the phone here. I mean, the mic, this and the phone. I got my first, I was the first person at UMBC to be given a gift of a portable phone. And it was one that I could put in my pocket and it was 1992. Wow. And it was as big as this, right? <laughs> but it was like an old slide rule. How many remember a slide rule? Remember? India is developing hundreds of additional universities, heavily STEM, okay? Here's the question for our country. How do we help Americans understand that we are part of a global economy, that we have the challenges uh, that our economy is connected to the European economy, connected to the Asian economy, that we cannot be by ourselves, number, number one. And number two, we've got all kinds of military challenges and questions about defending ourselves and all of that stem. All right? And I would argue that the more we're able to help students graduate from college, two-year and four-year with double-A degrees, post-secondary credentials, and four-year institutions, because we are understanding all of these are part of opportunities, the more we can talk about having a country that can help other countries, but that can protect ourselves. And the real question for the faculty in here is, how do we look at the challenges that we face? Now, when we found out that most people don't succeed in science and engineering, the first thing we did was to say, it must be a K through 12 problem, all right? So we had people from Harvard and MIT and Howard and Miami-Dade Community College from all kinds of institutions. And so we got the data. And what was clear was this. Colleges, four year would blame the two year. Two year would blame the high schools. The high school blames the elementary school. The elementary school blames the family. And the husband blames the wife's side of the family. We all pointed somebody, all right? But we decided to do something different and to look in the mirror. And this is what we found that's really counterintuitive. Listen carefully to this. The, the better prepared the student is, the higher the test scores, AP exams, fives, all right? High test scores, SAT and whatever. The more prestigious the university, the greater the chance the student leaves science in the first year or two. Did you get that? So everybody talks about going off to the most prestigious wow. places. And my line is they, they start off being a scientist, they become great lawyers all the time. That's supposed to be a joke, folks. Man. But it's true. I said it to the head of a big national agency, and she said, you told the truth. I started off at a very prestigious place with a perfect score. Um, I got a C in chemistry, at A's and everything else. I went home and told my parents, I love something else. Right? Because nobody wants to admit it. What is pleased with the work we did with a number of community colleges in the Gates program, uh, including here at Howard, on called the T-STEM program, where we were looking at curriculum alignment for faculty and looking at what we do in two-year places compared to four-year places and making sure we build the relationships. If you get a chance, there's an article written this year by my colleagues in the Journal of Chemical Education, for example, that looks at, and because one of the things I can tell you is that if students, if you do well at your institution now, one of the community colleges, you will do well in four-year institutions, including mine. So give your faculty a round of applause. Yeah. Give your faculty a round of applause. And you heard her saying that I talk about these four pillars of success. The first is high expectation. with you while minimizing the distance between you. You get it? Nice math problem, you see, you see? So it probably is in this range, but I've been talking to you. But listen to this, here's, here's what I want you to think about. When you think about community, when you think about what it takes, you heard the grit. We say, stop talking about who's smart and who's not. No, because if you got a smart group, what are you telling everybody else? Right, that's something, you know, it doesn't make sense. It has everything to do with how hard you work. It's the hard work. 
It's the discipline. It's the persistence. It's the resilience. It's never giving up. It's being willing to say, I don't understand. I need some help. I was in grad school at the University of Illinois in a course called Topology. And the guy had put a problem on the board. He was doing a problem. Oh, I was really. And I got that over and over. Well, we got our, I got our papers back for the midterm, and I had gotten an A minus somehow. Well, what I had done, but here's, and, and a lot of those guys, I was, a, I was a little chubby little grad student. I was young. I was really young. I was like 20. I'm, I mean, I'm a Southern, so I'm very nosy. I'm looking to see what they got on their papers, all right? <laughs> I'm not, I'm going to admit, I'm looking way more. I'm stretching my neck and looking. And some of them had gotten C's. And you know, in grad school, C you can't get. Okay, so I held my paper up and I said, I guess it was obvious. <laughs> I was bad. But what's it wasn't about that I was better than, no, no, they were well prepared, but they were so arrogant that they wouldn't ask for help. And there's the key that I want you to know. Whether you're at the two year, when you move over, you need to just say, I don't understand. I need help. Community means you're not ashamed to say, I don't understand. To me, the worst words I can hear from any young person is, I got this. Sometimes we get students, they come in and they really don't, but they say, oh, I got this, right? See if you're focusing as you need to focus. Go to see the faculty member. Listen, go and see the faculty member and just smile. Just, you know, I, that guy that told me it was obvious, I just kept going, and he just kept going. And I said, how you doing? I, said, I just ignored his being a little disgusted. And I said, I'm sorry, I don't know. Well, go work with other people. They won't work with me. I was straight up, they would not. They would not work with me. I said, I need your help. And he said, what? I said, no, they've never seen anybody looking like me in a math class. You know, they won't work with me. In fact, in grad school, I would go into the class, and it would be a numerical analysis or something, and the professor comes in, and every time they'd go right to me and say, oh, this is numerical analysis. <laughs> <laughs> you get it? All right. So I, even when people can be discouraging, you tell them, no, I'm going to get this. I'm going to work as hard as I need to get it, and then when I get knocked down, I'm going to get back up, and I need your help. All right? Because the way you think about yourselves the language that you use, the way you interact, and the values that you hold will shape who you are. I want to close with a story about a young man whose parents um, got into UMBC. He's an immigrant, wonderful kid, and, but he grew up in Montgomery County all of his life. Said, oh yeah, 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 to the faculty, thank you, but to the students, oh yeah, 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 it's a big deal, big deal, all right? So I want you to think about that little black boy sitting in the back of the church not wanting to use hand-me-down books and sitting in that jail when Dr. King said, you're going to make a difference. I kept thinking, what will the world be? I could never have imagined being president of a university with students from 100 countries so that I could see the significance of humankind and how we are so much alike. So much alike in so many ways. Students will tell me all the time their parents get on their nerves from every culture. <laughs> they, they, they become your actions. Watch your actions, they become your habits. Watch your habits, they become your character. I tell my students your character has everything to do with who you are when you don't think anybody can see you. What will you do when your mama's not there? Ah, so thoughts become words, words become actions, actions become habits. Habits become character. Watch your character, it becomes your destiny. Dreams and values. Young people, you're so special, and you can be even better. Thank you all. Woo. Uh, anything has to do with medicine. Right. Are they considered on the STEM? Like, can they that join the STEM question. scholars? Right, well, we would consider them. I mean, we think anything that is with STEM foundation is related. We would consider it. So we Fundamental yeah. C's, like yes. the... Uh, collaboration, yes. yeah. communication, yeah. critical thinking. Yes. The fourth one, uh -huh. creativity. Yeah. How do we? Yeah. I mean, creativity sure. in university, creativity in community. Sure. Colleges. Sure. Speak so he that? talked about wonderful everything from critical thinking to collaboration, community, the uh, uh, creativity. I will tell you two things. One, I'm always saying it's great to be in STEM, but you want to do things that broaden you beyond mm -hmm. STEM. We have to remember, just because I'm up here talking about STEM doesn't mean I don't have an appreciation for the arts, the humanities, and the social sciences. It's very important. I like that in the 40s in physics, said that when he was growing up in New York, all of his friends' mothers would ask him, what did you learn in school today? Every day, what did you learn in school? He said, not my Jewish mother. 
He said, my mother would say, Izzy, did you ask a good question today? And it was the encouraging of his curiosity that made him the thinker and the scientist he is. For, my, for the colleagues in the room, for the students, we want to create a climate that encourages asking questions and, and taking the time to look at the questions from different angles. It is more important than anything else. Let me not point that Let us students who start off in the yes, school in the year. Thank you very much. These are the students. Switch from. You got us in there. Hurry up. Everybody in there? <laughs> all right, thank you. <laughs> I'm proud of you all. <laughs> Ask him questions. Dr. Wabowski, incredible speech. Thank you. What do you think about these community college this STEM day? It's incredible. What do you it's think? wonderful. This is excellent. This is excellent. It will encourage so many people to keep going, which is so important. It really is. And what is your source of energy? Where you get uh, My students. My students give it to me. I am... Um, Always inspired by students. Okay. You're with me. I really Please will. Stand. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate that. No, no, this is since I'm right on campus. So um, we, we, I don't are, we actually have all this thing at 3.30. Yeah. Yeah, so, yeah okay. So if, you, so if you can make it, I'll be right Yeah, up. yeah. I should, I should be able to. That'd be so great. Whatever you want after that further uh, clarification. You can see the So what we're going to grants a new grant between for Hood and FCC is involved in that and so that's just starting now and NSF STEM is another one that Hood's working on that will involve FCC. So there have been a lot of collaborations between the two the three schools. That they can show how students can be engaged in research activities on campus or in the surrounding area so it's really been uh, great to have outside uh, talks from these people, but also kind of highlight that not every chemist is the stereotypical old guy with a beard standing, staring at a flash, wondering what's going on, you know, that there are these. Uh, not only grown uh, just in terms of how we have grown, but we actually, I kind of believe, and correct me if I'm wrong, is in, in, in general in influencing. So in, in what happened is when we have science symposium, we had our posters laid out, the big posters, people would come and say, I don't want to do that one. And we would say, yes, you can do that one. And then they would say, how? Because I only know how to do the small ones, and I actually don't know how to do a poster I've never done before. So, you know, just kind of... Hey. Hey. I have to take care of my <laughs> people. Yeah, I know. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, look at that. <laughs> Work like I'm showing you. So email me if you're getting frustrated, and I will help you get through those two hurdles. But I expect those two hurdles to be changed in an upgrade of the package soon. This is my whacking suit. Or I whack it. And I mean, it's, some of them don't, can't even like don't even cannot even write English. Like they don't know how to spell the word blue. Like he was spelling it B L O W. I'm like, no, no, it's B L U E. So he had to translate it into Arabic so he could understand. So it does take some time. And then I guess it depends on how how old you are and how much exposure you have to it. Um, but just be cognizant of the fact that you might not hold no, it for time. And then sometimes, you know, how do you have to do it? Yeah, it's just a... Our chairperson that we had was really, I guess, a visionary. So one of the things that she wanted to do, because we're so far to the West, it's hard for us to get research experiences for students without them having to drive an hour away and they don't all have a car, they don't have money for gas, or they, they need to stay on campus. So one of the things that she wanted to do was develop an organizing study abroad program. And it is challenging, but it's rewarding, and it's also fun. Uh, and behind this program, there are some limitations and also some restrictions, like you have to have certain number of participants in order for it to meet. Um, I've really enjoyed it, and it's been great. So for my journey, um, up until my senior year of high school, I was really undecided as to what I wanted to do with my life. So 
Scottsdale uh, senior year when I applied to Carroll. Um, my administrator came up to me and asked, like, what did you want to do? And by that time I figured I knew it was sciences, but I didn't know what part of it. And he's like, well, there's this new group called the STEM Scholars. And I was like, all right. I want to go to one, two, and now chemistry. And through that, I think, thank you, Okay, great. Anybody else? Studying is a short time horizon, learning is a long And that's, you know, it comes down to that often. Um, studying is basically you look at material, reviewing it, trying to understand it. Learning um, is, is where you actually, um, it's, it's through study and, 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 and interacting with study and that you actually are able to apply the actual concepts. Um, but but you could, sometimes you could study for hours and maybe why I think all right, I can come over there. Yeah, yeah you yeah. can come this no, that's better. So, yeah. I'm just getting this angle right see. now. Yeah. Here you can go right here. Yeah. Okay. So you, so you got the highlights there? Yeah. You can go to the next mm -hmm. one. And even if I lose this, uh -huh. you will actually get the close view. Okay. So I go next. So once you know about all these parts, then we go to the segments. So we're giving you the controls just like how you would actually operate a real microscope, right? So interacting, when he said interacting with us, like you know, on a YouTube, if you're watching a YouTube video, you just watch yeah, yeah, it. Just mm -hmm. watch here now we are actually interacting with the microscope like you're doing it. With the step by step. So it's like, just not randomly doing it, but there is, you follow the procedure that you would actually set in an experiment, right? Yeah. Place a clean slide on the stage so that the op... Exactly. 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 So once it is there in your thing, uh, it's there forever. The difference is that 